What's going on? I'm Larry Hoover Jr. and I'm rocking with Street Certified News. Yo, it's your boy Kiss, man. Shout out to Street Certified News. Yo, it's your boy L. Hit him, Mr. Oh, yeah, y'all already know what it is, man. I'm rocking with Street Certified News. We got behind the scenes, man. We're gonna tie this bitch up. What up, this your boy Bum J. We rocking with Street Certified News. He's that great. Man, Street Certified News, man. Shout out Big Bo. Shout out Walker. Street Certified, man. On December 10th, 1999, South Suburban Robbins, Illinois police responded to calls of gunshots and a man identified as Joseph Ward laying dead in front of a local residence. Upon arriving at the scene, Detective Jerome McGee, who was at the time under his own federal investigation for extorting drug dealers and dealing drugs himself, took witness statements from two individuals at the scene, Paula Scott and Christopher Lacey. Paula Scott, a local drug user, in her original statements to Detective McGee claimed she did not see or know who committed the murder, despite being arm's distance from Joseph Ward when he was killed. And local drug dealer Christopher Lacey, who lived at the residence where the shooting took place, also gave a statement and originally denied knowing who was responsible despite admitting he was standing outside across the street from his home when the shooting took place. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Robbins, Illinois was a small drug-ridden suburb just three miles south of the city of Chicago. Being such a small town, cops, drug addicts, and drug dealers would all seem to know each other. And some believe, including the federal government, that they all conspired to work together to supply drugs while local police like Jerome McGee were paid to look the other way. This would be the landscape Robbins residents found themselves in in December 1999 when Joseph Ward was shot and killed. Four months after the death of Joseph Ward, Sergeant Detective Terrence Franklin of Robbins PD would take over the unsolved case. By that time, Detective Jerome McGee and witness Christopher Lacey were under federal indictments and cooperating with authorities. This is when two names would come up as possible shooters in that December 1999 murder. Federal informant Christopher Lacey would claim the killers were two of Joseph Ward's best friends, Ivy Kelly and Demetrius Bear Hampton. Let everybody know, bro, like uh, your name and, and just, uh, uh, you know, kind of like the beginning part of your story. Uh, my name is uh, Ivy Kelly. I'm from Robbins, Illinois, uh, by way of Peter Park, Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago, but was basically moved to Robbins when I was young and grew up there. Uh, I was accused of killing my, my friend, Joseph. Been my friend since I was about 14 years old. Uh, in 2000, in March of 2000, I was accused of uh, killing my friend. He died in December of 99, December 10th of 99. He was murdered. Uh, they never initially said that they thought that I had anything to do with his murder, but uh, four months later, uh, one of the witnesses, the state's witness, uh, Chris Lacey, got arrested for another crime and uh, said that he saw me and my co-defendant, Demetrius Hampton, uh, murder my friend. On March 27th, 2000, Detective Franklin would again speak with witness Paula Scott. And Scott, by this time, had changed her story. When shown a photo lineup, Paula Scott will also identify Ivy Kelly and Demetrius Hampton as the men who walked up to Joseph Ward and shot and killed him. Based off the witness Paula Scott's identification and the statements of federal informant Christopher Lacey, Ivy Kelly and Demetrius Hampton would be arrested and charged with the murder of their friend, Joseph Ward.
the night of Joe's funeral. Chris told me he, he didn't know anything, you know, but I didn't believe him. So I was pressing him a little bit. So I may have offended him or hurt his feelings, but uh, I would never murder my friend, and Chris knows that. So uh, they charged me with his murder, and I'm still in a state of shock. You know, when they got me in the police station, uh, the detective Franklin, who was the second detective put on the case, the original detective who took uh, Paula Scott's statement the night of December 10th, ended up going to prison for uh, racketeering, bribery and racketeering. But, that was uh, McGee. Not trying to cut you off, but that was Jerome McGee. Yeah, that was Jerome McGee, the original detective on the case. Okay. The next detective on the case was uh, Terrence Franklin. Terrence Franklin took over the case, uh, allegedly, March 17th of 2000. So on March 17th of 2000, he solved the case. All the same day, the same day he took over the case, allegedly, uh, Chris Lacey, who was in custody for whatever, we still don't know to this day what he was arrested for. It could have been murder. could have been anything. But uh, so ironically, he solved the case that day, got a statement from Chris Lacey that he never simultaneously took. He also got a statement from Paula Scott that he never simultaneously took. Uh, and uh, 10 days later, called the prosecutor and charged us with murder. Eventually, both Kelly and Hampton would be found guilty in separate trials of the murder of Joseph Ward and sentenced to 30 years in prison. During the trial, both witnesses, Paula Scott and Christopher Lacey, recanted their previous statements and said that they didn't know who committed the crime. The prosecution would impeach these statements and instruct the jury to take only into account their March 2000 statements ones possibly coerced by police four months after the crime. Since his conviction, Ivy Kelly and Demetrius Hampton have steadfast fought to prove their innocence. I went to trial in uh, June of 2003. When I got to trial, uh, I'm still confused through this whole time. The whole three years I'm waiting on trial, I'm confused. And I'm just knowing that the truth is going to come out. So we finally get to trial. And uh, both of the witnesses recanted. So uh, Chris Lacey's statement was, well, I wasn't sure then, and I'm not sure to this day. Paula's statement was, Chris told me that. Right? right. So uh, I'm thinking, okay, that should be that. So what the state did, Tom Darman, that's the that's the prosecutor's name, uh, he impeached his own witnesses. He impeached his own witnesses and used their statements, their prior inconsistent statements, to convict me as evidence of my guilt. My co-defendant's statement never came in at my trial because our trials were severed. They had been trying numerous times to get him to uh, become a state's witness, and he wouldn't do it. So, I just, uh, I was just lost when they convicted me, first and foremost, because I'm thinking in my mind, okay, these people finally told the truth, right? They asked Paula Scott, well, uh, how did you pick him out in the lineup? She said, uh, well, they asked me, did I know Ivy? And I picked him out simple, easy to understand. So basically they suggested to her to pick me out. Right. So uh, then uh, they asked her, well, uh, why did you say it was him? And she said, because Chris told me that, which makes sense because her prior statement, she said she didn't know who it was. And the statement from the night of the murder, she said she did not know who it was. So they still inevitably impeached her and, and found me guilty. Right before I went to trial, I want to back up just a little bit. Right before I went to trial, uh, we found out that the detective, the original detective, Jerome McGee, 
had indeed authored reports from the night of my friend's murder. The prosecutor, Joseph Codman, went up to Oxford, Wisconsin, where Detective Jerome McGee was in prison at the time, and interviewed him. So in the process of this interview, uh, he asked him, did he interview uh, anybody from the night of the shoot? So he said that yes, he did indeed interview Paula Scott. And so Mr. Cosman asked him, well, what did she say? And he said that she said that she didn't see anything. He didn't ask who removed them. He didn't ask where they were. And he didn't ask why they were removed, why, why they were removed. These are all questions that a prosecutor that's, that's, that's seeking the truth would ask. Right, and wouldn't and wouldn't your defense have the right to get those original reports as well? Yes, because we have the right to any exculpatory evidence. Then we know for sure that at least one of the pages in the file exculpated us because he said he interviewed her and she said, didn't know who it was. He didn't see who it was. From February 1996 to May 1996, investigators made audio and video recordings of Jerome McGee as he accepted nine payoffs, totaling $1,350 from a drug dealer who was then working undercover for federal authorities. Besides providing protection, McGee eventually admitted he gave drug dealers two-way radios to assist communications during drug deals, and even once warned a dealer not to sell narcotics at a housing development the next weekend because of heavy police activity. Another former Robbins police officer, James Cooper, would also be caught taking a payoff from the same drug dealer. Both McGee and Cooper would eventually be fired and sentenced to jail time. Detective Sergeant Terrence Franklin, who would take over the case after four months, was able to get witnesses to change their statements, ultimately leading to the arrest of Kelly and Hampton. Franklin would soon be fired by the Robbins Police Department for unknown reasons. In 2020, after being found to have accepted his guilt, Demetrius Bear Hampton was released from Illinois State Prison. Now a free man. We spoke with Hampton and asked why he felt he was out of prison while his co-defendant Ivy Kelly was still fighting for his freedom. During our conversation, Hampton told us, Robin's police coerced a statement. All I claim is my innocence. That's why I'm fighting so hard. I love Joe. I just find all of that like really, I don't. I don't understand how the the prosecutors could be like, okay, this is okay. In Cook County in the state of Illinois, um, I mean, basically around the country, when when it comes yeah. to when it comes to the justice system and and, and people of African descent, African Americans, black people in America, this is how the justice system works for us, and this yeah. is why. And, and this is why people is afraid of the police. This is why people say, man, fuck 12. Yeah. Because this, this is, is how they treat this, us. This is endemic in our communities. In minority communities, this is endemic. That, that's what's going on in the minority communities. It's, it, it, the us versus, us versus them mentality is created by them. Absolutely. Because you can't trust them. You can't trust the prosecutor to do the right thing. You can't trust that if he sees something that he's going to be like, oh, no, this don't make no sense. Hey, let me figure, you got to explain this better to me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, there's a difference between a person telling you something so that you could hear the answer, like the truth, or telling you something so that you could craft a way how to fit it into your box. Exactly. And And I feel like that's, that's what they do. The prosecutors are like, hey, give me the story that fit the box. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what they do. I promise you. And then you got to remember, when, when we got arrested for this, that was an era of corruption right there within the, the, the police departments, the South Suburban Police Department, uh, Harvey, Ford Heights, Chicago Heights, you know, uh, Robbins. 
you know, there was an era of corruption going on in all these police departments, as well as in the prosecutor's office in Cook County. Because I keep saying the only thing a corrupt cop can do is arrest you. The prosecutor, prosecutors do the heavy lifting. They try you. They uh, 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 they charge you. They try you. And they seek to convict you. They do all the heavy lifting. So when these people come back after all these years, and they be like, oh, well, a crooked cop did this, that's not that you better believe that the state's attorney knows he was a crooked cop. When Kelly's conviction was ultimately overturned in 2023, an appeals judge would note star witness Christopher Lacey's federal informant status never being brought up on cross-examination in the original trial. Also, the blatant corruption of the Robbins Police Department at the time of the arrest. Believing corrupt officials within the Robbins Police Department put the murder on him in Hampton due to them not providing payments to officers. A fact Ivy also believes is the reason why he's continued to be locked up. Fed up with how slow things were moving after his conviction was overturned, Ivy Kelly would continue to sit in jail for nine years before finding out that the state of Illinois intended to retry him for a crime he had already done 25 years on. Ivy Kelly's legal team in late 2023 filed a motion to dismiss all charges. To this day, that motion has been postponed a number of times, while the state subpoenas these former dirty cops and remaining witnesses. Although Demetrius Bear Hampton is out of prison, his life he feels was forever taken from him. Something that he reiterated to us a number of times during our interview. Surprisingly, Kelly, who is still locked up, has a different take on how things ultimately played out. The only thing I've been trying to do is get my story out and, 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 and seek justice. All I want is justice, man. They murdered my friend and got away with it and then charged me, tried me, and convicted me of it. That was, I'm still uh, in amazement. Like, I'm still, like, lost every day. And I just use that for my motivation to try to keep going. Like, when they when they offered me time to sit a third, I was like, no. Like, no. Like, no, that's not what this is about. That's not why I fought all this time to get back here. I, I fought all this time to get back this way for you to acknowledge what you did to me. Not only what you did to me, what you did to my friend's family. They are the victims in all this. You convicted somebody who slept in their house, who they fed Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner, fed me when I was homeless. And you convinced them that I betrayed somebody I loved, which I could have never did. So I, I felt like, like that was a slap in the face. And then the judge tried to convince me to take it. Because that's what matters to them. I was sentenced to 30 years. At best, they didn't get a little bit more than five years out of me. If they wrongfully convict me again, that's what you got coming. So, uh, we fight on. Right. Thank you for using Global Telling. Hey, everybody. I want to thank you for all your support. And I want to remind you that uh, Friday I'll be doing another live at 7 p.m. Central. I love you all and thank you much for your support. And just keep fighting with me for justice. I appreciate you.